Good. Now we're learning <clears throat> the half Torah of this week's Torah reading. After we finish reading the Torah uh, this week in part, what's called Parsha Titzava, that talks mostly about the <clears throat> the vet, the garments of the Kohanim and the inauguration of the tabernacle, what they had to do for the seven days of the inauguration. One second, close the door. How they brought special sacrifices for the seven days of the inauguration. We learned a little bit about that the, uh, yesterday. <clears throat> okay, now we Jewish people, we Jewish people, though, we believe <clears throat> and we're strengthened by the, the prophets that there's going to be a third temple. A third temple is going to be built. And in this third temple is also going to be offered sacrifice and etc. <clears throat> and there's Differing opinions about how exactly this um, this is going to be built, but according to the Zohar, and uh, there's also opinions. And there's a, there's a, a even a toast vote in the Talmud, etc. That says that it's going to be built from heaven, and it's based on the sentences Miktash Hashem Yidecha in the song that the Jewish people sang when they crossed over the sea. So right at the end of that song. And they sang, it says, Mikdash Hashem Yadecha, that the holy temple will be made by your hands, God. And so some people take that literally and mean it to mean that the third temple is going to really come from heaven, that it's already ready. It's spiritually there or something much more real than spiritual. And it's just waiting to manifest itself here in the world. And the only thing that's preventing it is our sins. And that's what Ezekiel is talking about here. Ezekiel here is talking about the third temple. Let's see, this. maybe one of the explanations here says it. <clears throat> I, I learned from another <clears throat> commentary. Okay, so it says <clears throat> that this third temple is going to come from heaven, and the only thing that's preventing it is your sins. And so now, <clears throat> Ezekiel is giving everybody a description of this holy temple as it is in heaven and how it will be on the physical world. On the physical world. Like it's a little bit complicated, but not that complicated. Here mostly we're dealing with the uh, the altar, the big altar that's outside, the big altar that's outside. So the altar, let me just give you a short look at this altar over here. I, the, this is the best picture I could find. And it's not an accurate picture, but it's the most accurate that I could find, at least to give you a little bit of an idea what the altar looked like. Here it goes. Here. Here, see? Here, altar. Huh? All right. It's got all these steps over. I don't know why, but anyway. The altar basically was in this form, though. That was in this form. Let's see this case. Uh -huh. The altar was in this form. What is the form? Three layers. There was a base. It would have been more, it would have been more sort of accurate just to have one of these bases over here. Anyway, there was a base, then there was a second level, and then there was a third level. So it was like a three layer, three layer cake. But in, in this case, it was made from. In the tabernacle, it was hollow. Here, this part was hollow, and they would fill it. But in the temples, it wasn't hollow. <clears throat> it wasn't <clears throat> anyway, it was three layers. And <clears throat> there was, on the corner, there were what's called horns. They were not shaped like this, but they were horns. And these horns sort of jutted out a little bit. And there was a ramp. The ramp went up. And this person used poetic license, but at least it's it's got a, a, a this, I mean, how we got in through this, what this thing is, I don't know, but anyway. Okay, but that's the basic thing. It's three layers. This is one layer here. This should be straight. And this is another layer, and this is another layer. We're going to see in the third temple, the way he's going to explain it, this was two amas, and the is like about a, a foot and a half. So this is, let's say, three feet. And this is four feet, which means six feet high. A little bit more. And this is another six feet. So according to what he says, this was it was 16 feet high altogether. 
So it's like a one and a half story house, a little bit more. And then there were these things on each corner. Okay, now, <clears throat> now there's just one more thing. We talked about this a lot of times. What is this whole idea of the holy temple? And what did they do in the holy temple? They made sacrifices. I mean, come on, is this really what Judaism is about? Killing animals, <clears throat> making a, the whole world is God's holy temple. Every person is God's holy temple. Everyone's heart is the altar. <clears throat> Isn't that true? Of course, yes, of course that's true. But that does not in any way detract from the fact that God wants details and God wants deeds. He wants action. God wants us to use this physical world the way that he wants. Now, if you know a little bit about physics, and if you know however little that you know about physics, you probably know more than me. But the little bit that I know about physics is that they still have not figured out in any way what exactly the world is made from. <laughs> What's going on over here, right? First, they thought it was atoms. And then there was a, this huge, massive space between the nucleus and the in the electron. And what exactly the electron is not so sure. Now they're finding out that the nucleus and the electron, that's also not really made of any sort of stuff. It's sort of like energy or, or particles or waves or anyway, units of this. And, and then this course, other, other people say, no, it's made from spirit. Everything is spiritual. It, it, what, really, who made the spirit? Where did the spirit come from? So the fact of the matter is, is that everything is a big miracle, but God is very exact in every detail of this miracle, which is called the world. And every single detail is very precise. How much more so every detail of how we use the world has to be very precise. So it's true, our heart is an altar and the world is God's temple and all these things. This is all true. It's 100% is true. But that does in no way detracts from the fact that God wants us to do these things which have no understanding to us. And if you look at a book of physics, you'll see that also has no understanding to us, unless you're, you know, you're, you're a professor or something like that. <clears throat> and I'm sure that to them, it also doesn't. They, they know how to use the physicists. They know how, to, how things work, but they don't know really what they're made of. They just have theories about it. I mean, if somebody comes along with a better, better theory, right, that says, no, the world is really made of green cheese, <clears throat> and they have formulas that it works better than everybody has to accept it. Because that's what it is, right? If you can come up with a formula that the world is really made from, from, uh, from what it is, marbles or, or from, you know, Cracker Jacks, something like that, which is pretty stupid. But if you have a formula that, that according to this Cracker Jack theory, everything works, then everyone has to accept it. Everyone, because it's only about it works. It doesn't work or not. Here we're talking about not if what works, it could be that it doesn't even seem to work, but what the Torah says is true, right? The Jewish people have suffered for thousands of years because they're Jewish. The whole thing is not working. We're working in order to bring Mashiach. It doesn't work. Nevertheless, it's true. So that's the whole idea of the temple is to do what is true with the world, even though we don't understand it. And what does God want? Sacrifices. Why he wants the sacrifices? Ask him. Ask God, right? Soon there'll be the Mashiach here. You can ask him. He'll tell you if there's an answer to it. It says Mashiach is going to come and answer all questions. Tishbi, it says Elijah the prophet is going to come and he'll answer all the questions that we got. But we got a lot of questions. I'm sure you do also. I hope so. Because if you don't have questions, then it means the whole thing, you're not interested in the whole thing. But if you do, this, by the way, is a picture of the third temple, according to the way he understands it. Right? This is the way of, this is the picture of the third temple as it is understood by some people, according to this uh, prophecy of Ezekiel. Okay, so let's just go, to, now we're learning. This is the, the, the um, altar, here's the altar. There's a bottom, bottom layer, a middle layer, and a top layer. Okay, let's go, maybe we can understand this now. Back to, says God to Ezekiel. Ata ben Adam, Haged is ben Israel, speak to the Jewish people. At the bayit, about this temple, third temple, the Akalmu Avonatechem, and they should be ashamed of their sins. Umaradu at the Tachnit, show them all the measures of this building, of the whole pro of the whole program. 
of the whole, uh, the, 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 how do you say, the blueprints. And here it goes. The im, one more, uh, one more preface. If im nichlamu, and if the Jewish people are, how do you say, ashamed, embarrassed, uh, 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 how do you say, cast down, whatever, because of everything that they've done, tzura tabayat then the form of the house and its plans and the doors that go in and out and all the forms of all the rooms in it and all of the laws that are involved in it would have to be done and all the tzurotav <coughs> and all the different details you should make known to them and write it down before them and they should keep all these plans these blueprints and all of the laws, and they should do with it. Uh, if you do, if the Jewish people follow what I say, then I'll give them the third temple, and everybody's going to be happy. This is the law of the house, the third temple, and it's first of all, it's going to be on the top of the mountain where, where the temple is now. Call Gavula Saviv, all of the area around, outside of the temple, is going to be holy. Kodesh Kadoshim. It's going to be holy of holies. Now, right now, the holy of holies is only in this inner room. But it says in the future that the holiness of Israel is going to spread out of the whole world, and the holiness of the temple will spread out all over Jerusalem, and the holiness of the holy of holies will spread out over the whole uh, the, the temple mount. Here it goes. This is going to be the form of the of the house. Let's see, maybe we got a few commentaries over here. <clears throat> okay. Oh. Good, so we're learning about the form of the third temple. Rashi here indicates that this would have been the final temple. The Jewish people wouldn't have sinned, but instead they got as a sort of a consolation prize, the second temple. <clears throat> the second temple was supposed to be the last one, but because the Jewish people didn't <clears throat> act properly, so they got this second temple, and uh, there's going to have to be a third one, and there will. And this is the form of the third one. Ready? These are the measurements of the altar. The amot ama, ama v'tafach. Sometimes an ama is usually five um, fists, but sometimes it's six. So it depends on where it is. You'll see the chika ama, the bottom layer of this uh, altar. The ama rochav. Gavula al Safata Saviv Zeret Echad Bezeh Gava Mizbeach. Okay, let's go back to this picture again. Here. As I said to you, this is not an accurate picture. The, the altar is supposed to, it's supposed to look something more like this. The bottom is straight, and this is called the Chik. And this is two amas high, and it goes in one ama. Then the next one is above it. Is going to be four amas high, and it goes in one ama. Then the next one above it is going to be going to be four amas high, and it's going to go in one ama. Right. So let's have a look. Let's have a look. And this whole well, okay. <clears throat> Here it is. So that's the chik. The chik is going to be. <clears throat> it's going to go up two amas and go in one ama. That's this bottom, the bottom layer. It's, three, it's a three-layer altar. From the chek to the ground to the azara. The azara, that's the second layer. A tachtona, it's two amas. And it's wide, one ama. It's indented, one ama. And from this azara, the second level, a katana to the azara gadola, it's four amas. And there's, this, the, there's, the, there's a middle line around this middle uh, layer so it's two, two, uh, two amas below the line and two amas above the line. And the reason for the line is there are certain sacrifices where the blood is sprinkled above the line, and sometimes the blood is sprinkled below the line. 
in any case, this middle layer is he calls it the azara, and that's also four amas high, and it's also indented one ama. Again, an ama is like about a foot and a half or something like that. But that's according to the opinion that it's five uh, hand breaths, but there's one opinion that it's six hand breaths, so that's a little bit more. It'd be like a, a foot and, and three quarters or something. All right, then there's the har ale. The har ale, that's this upper, the, the, the upper uh, layer of the altar, har ale. This is four amas, and also ulamayla, a karnot, arba. This is including the, uh, the horns that were on top of it. Okay, so let's go back to the picture again so you have a little bit of an idea because when the third temple comes, you'll be able to say, oh, this is what we learned in the class. Here it is. This is because this is outside, right? Where, where is the, uh, the, alt, the, this is the picture of the, uh, here, this is the third temple. This is the uh, artist's interpretation of the third temple as taken from his understanding of Rashi. And here we have what's called the Holy of Holies. Here is the holy, and here's the altar. So you'll be, everyone will be able to see the altar. It's right outside. Right? It's in the same form as the first temple. So, so this is two amas. It goes in and dents one hour. It's, it is not steps like here. It's straight, right? like something like this. But this is two amas, three feet. It goes in one ama. Then it goes up another, let's say, six feet. Then it goes in an ama. Then this is, this is called the are, are, are il, and it goes up four more amas. Good, okay. And this har el is 12 amas wide and 12 amas uh, long and 12 amas wide. And it's uh, in quarters, four quarters. And it's, it's, it's divided really, it's um, the, the, the top of it. If you look down on the top of the altar, so there are four squares. And it's divided into four squares. Really, the top of the altar is 24 amas by 24 amas. But the 24 amas, <clears throat> each one is divided into two squares. Right? So, so it ends up looking like this. You have it's 24 amas here, 24 amas there. And this 24 amas is divided into 12, 12, 12, 12. 12. And there's four squares of 12 inside of each one. Right, inside of each one. That's how they divide up the top of the and really it's more than that because it's really not 12 by 12, it's really 14 by 14, because they added a little space around there where the koanim can walk around. So they in order to make it square, so commensurately they increase the size of each one of these four. So it's so really it comes up to be 28 by 28 on the top. On the top is 28 by 28. Okay, this makes sense because the bottom is, is 32 by 32. And the, so we said the bottom lid is 32 by 32. So it goes in, um, we said one arm on each side. So that makes it 30 by 30. Then you go up again, it goes in again. So that makes it 28 by 28. And that's how the size of this upper uh, thing is. Well, let's look at the picture again. Maybe we can get a little bit of a, here we go. Here, the top of this, the top of it, this is really 28 by 28. So this over here is 32 by 32, this bottom layer here like this, 32 by 32. And then it goes in one arm on both sides. So it makes this thing is like 30 by 30. Then this goes in on both sides. So that takes another, another two. So that makes 28 by 28. That's how big this top one is. 20 amas, we're talking about amas. <clears throat> and God said to me, this is, is Ezekiel, Ben Adam, the only prophet when God calls him Ben Adam is Ezekiel. Ben Adam, this is what God, the Lord says. These are the laws of the altar on the day that you make it, hey, so that it will be made to sacrifice on its sacrifices and throw upon it the blood. Like I said, some add that. 
some sacrifices have to be. Yeah, you throw the blood of the sacrifices. And you should, the Kohanim, okay, now you should give the Kohanim and the Levites that they come from Tzadok. Now Tzadok was the first, the name of the first Kohen that served under King Solomon. That was the beginning of the first temple, right? So all of the Kohanim come after him. They're all called from the seed, from the, the family of Tzadok. Bakrovim Eli, and all those who are close to me, says God, if they want to serve me, you have to bring for them one ox for a sin offering. And take from the blood and put it on the four corners, on the four horns that are on the four corners of the Azara, which that we said, the uh, and on the Gavul around it. And that's right on the, on the corners of the altar. We said that was called the Azara. And it will be forgiven, right? That Azora, that's that's like the whole area over there of the on the top of the altar. We said it was called the Azora. That's how he calls it. You should take this um, uh, par, this ox, this ox, and burn it near the house, near the holy temple, outside of the holy temple, because we said that the holy temple outside of it was also holy. In the days of the Mashiach, we said that the, the holiness of Israel was spread out to the whole world, and the holiness of Jerusalem was spread out to all of Israel, and the holiness of the Holy of Holies was spread out to the whole mountain, Harabayas, or to all of Jerusalem. So the whole thing is going to be holy. On the second day, this, is going to, this whole process is going to take seven days. On the second day, you should give. You should sacrifice a goat, uh, a pure, with no blemish, for a sin offering, and clean. That by that you will clean, uh, purify the altar, <clears throat> just like you did with, with the, the the axe you did to the kohanim. So you will do with a goat for the altar. When you finish from this sin offering, then you should bring another ox pure and a ram from the sheep. And you should sacrifice them before God. And Hishlichu, a Kohanim, a lamb, Melech, and the Kohanim should throw on the parts of this offering salt. And they should be brought up on the altar, on this altar we just described, for a sacrifice to God. Now, all the sacrifices had to have salt thrown on them. So this is no exception. Lo tashpit melach. Seven days you should make this, um, the, uh, the, the goat of sacrifices every day. And also this ox and the, uh, and the ram from the sheep. Every day you should do this thing, this whole process over and over again. It says these were not really days of inauguration like it was for Moses. And we never saw that there was such a, a, a sacrifices like this on the altar, even though that our rabbis say in the Gomorrah and Menachos that the, the Miluim in the days of Ezra, they did something like in the days of Moses, but usually it wasn't. If we looked in the days of Moses, we saw the sacrifices were totally different. We just finished learning about that. You can go over it here and see. Also, there was what's called the, the Mea Miluim, that for 12 days after they finished this inauguration, when the, the first 12 days when the altar was working, it was in, so they all the uh, the heads of the tribes, they brought exactly the same offerings. And that you can find in, in Naso, in, Prasha, in the Parsha of the Torah called Naso, and right in the beginning of the book of uh, Numbers. For no.
Seven days you should also uh, uh, purify the altar and uh, refine the altar and purify it and inaugurate it. The altar, so the koanim and the altar both are. When the days finish, Excuse me one moment. That's right. When these days finish, it will be on the eighth day, and for and 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 afterwards that the Kohanim will make all the regular sacrifices and all the peace offerings, and they will be desired by me, so says. God. That is this week's Haftorah. So when they read it, you know what it is. You know what's being said. What's being said? I was speaking about the Shalom. Okay, so we just learned about the altar that is going to be built in the days of the Mashiach. By the by, by by God, it's going to come from heaven. That's what it says, and this is in the prophecy of Ezekiel. So, we just finished the class. I see that some people just came in now, so we just finished the class. So maybe I'll take this couple of minutes. If there's new people that just came in, you can't just close the door. No people came in, so <clears throat> let's just say I'll, I'll say a little small something. We're going to have a class tomorrow morning. Also at 8.15, where we're going to finish the speech, the Devar Malchut, the speech that the Lubavitcher Rebbe gave in 1992 for this week's Torah portion. So, but let me just say in a short way, <clears throat> the last um, Hasidic discourse that the Rebbe passed out to the Hasidim to be learned was this week. And this was the week when he, the Rebbe had a stroke. Right? This was the, not, not this week, I'm sorry. And then afterwards, the Rebbe had a stroke. So this was the, the last... Um, uh, the last Hasidic discourse that the Rebbe passed out, that he, the Rebbe gave out to the Hasidim, was about this week, Atat Tetzaveh. So the Rebbe says some very interesting things in it. And of course, the Hasidim look at it as this last mamar, the last Hasidic discourse or essay that the Rebbe gave out as uh, very, very exact directions about what we're supposed to do. Now, you all know, and we've repeated this a lot of times, that the whole purpose of the world and the whole purpose of Judaism is to bring Mashiach. Mashiach is gonna be a Jew, just like Adam, first man. And his job is to fix up the world, but we see Adam didn't do it. So then afterwards came Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, about 2000 years after Abraham, about after Adam, and they began this whole process of fixing the world up to bring Mashiach. In the language of Hasidut, it's called bringing the Shekhinah back to the world, bringing God's presence back to the world. And it said there were seven generations from Adam that drove God's presence away, and seven generations beginning with Abraham, who, like I said, was about 2,000 years after Adam, and they began bringing God's presence back to the world. And Moses, that he was number seven, he brought the Shekhinah back to this physical world in the Holy Temple. And anyone could go to the Holy Temple and they could feel that there's a creator that's creating them. And they could feel that there's a purpose for their being created. They could feel it. <clears throat> so therefore, it was a very happy place, but commensurate with this happiness and this feelings, etc., there was also... Uh, opposing feelings, because nothing comes easy in this world. That's why God made the world. If you wanted it to be easy, you would have just left angels up there, and they would have been easy singing up there all the time. <clears throat> what angels do burning up. So he made this world. <clears throat> so this week's Torah portion has a very interesting message, and it says that Moses tells the Jewish people to bring to him pure crushed olive oil for the lamp. And of course, the Rebbe and other commentaries point out 
that Moses had nothing to do with the lamp. The lamp was lit, the menorah, it's the lamp, was lit by Aaron. He was the one that lit the lamp. Why did everyone tell him to bring it to Moses? So the language that God uses to Moses is, Ata at ben Ezra, you command the Jewish people. <clears throat> so like we learned in the class in the morning, the word tetzaveh also means to connect. <clears throat> the Jewish people <clears throat> have to have someone that connects them to reality, to their true identity. That's called return, called doing tshuva. Tshuva means to return to your true identity, return back to who you really are. Who is, a, who is a Jew? What is a Jew? A Jew, what's the essence of a Jew? The essence of all mankind, but especially the Jew is supposed to teach everyone this. That's the Jews are chosen. To teach everyone how much God loves them, that everyone is special, everyone is being created by God, especially individually, but we're being created in order to serve God, to serve God, to return a little bit of this energy. So by the Jewish people, it's not so simple. By the Jewish people, it's not so simple. This pure olive oil, this pure oil, which is inside of every Jew, that this is what lights up the lamps. This is what illuminates the whole world. This is what gives warmth and love and meaning and light to every minute of everyone's life. When people feel the creator, so people become more dynamic, right? But the, the only way you can do this is <clears throat> through Moses. Moses has to do it. And how does Moses do it? He teaches the Jewish people to crush themselves. That's what Moses does. The Jewish people, in this case, are compared to olives. And the Jewish people have this tremendous potential to make light and warmth in the world. Every Jew, whether they know it or not, whether they want it or not, whether they accept it or not, whether they, they reject it or not, <clears throat> every Jew has this amazing ability to bring warmth and meaning into the world, <clears throat> like olive oil, like an olive, but the only way you can get this oil out of the olive is by crushing it. And the Rebbe brings an example from Purim. We're just going to have, we're having the holiday of Purim soon. <clears throat> As we mentioned in the Mimer, in the speech of the Rebbe, that what was the miracle of Purim? What happened on Purim? The Jewish people, previous to the decree of Haman, were possibly in the best situation they'd ever been in the history of the world. Never been in such a situation. The, the queen of the world, was Esther. Esther got married to Ahasuerus. It said he ruled the whole world, Ahasuerus. It says, 127 countries, the whole entire world belonged to Ahasuerus. And who is his wife? A Jewish, Jewess. So we have a Jewish lady, she's queen of the whole world. He didn't know she was Jewish until afterwards, but nevertheless, she was Jewish. One of his chief advisors was Mordechai, the head of the Jews. <clears throat> Mordechai sat in the gate of the king, it says. Not only that, the king invited all the Jews to his big party. He made a big party, invited all the Jews, all the Jews that were in this capital city, the Shushan, that was his capital city, all the Jews. So the Jews were really riding high. They were in the best situation politically and socially and that, they, that ever. But they made a big mistake by going to this meal because the meal was to commemorate the <clears throat> end of hope that the third temple would be, that the second temple would be built. When did the holiday of Purim happen? Between the first temple and the second temple. There were seven years between the, <clears throat> the, the, the seven years between the destruction of the first temple and the building of the second temple. That, sec, that 20 years, that 70 years, I'm sorry, all the Jews were in Babylon spread all over the world. They were they're in Babylon, but they were in other places also. Here we see they were by Achashverosh. 
And everyone knew that it was going to be a 70 year exile. Everyone knew it was a prophecy, clear prophecy, and a Jewish prophecy. And everyone knew that's how long it was going to be. And Akashverish also believed in this prophecy, but he miscalculated. And he thought that the, that the 70 years had already ended. And we see that the Jews were not redeemed, and that that was it. The Jews could give up hope, and the Jews agreed with him. And he made a big party celebrating the end of Jewish hope. And the Jews said, what do you mean we don't have any hope? We have hope that you'll like us. Right? No, we're sitting good. No one to this. <clears throat> and suddenly came upon the Jews the worst decree there ever was in the history of the world. To destroy, liquidate every single Jew in one day. There was no time to run away. There was no place to run away. Akashvir ruled the whole world. But there was a loophole. There was a loophole in the decree. The decree was Lashmid La Rogel abated Kaliudin to destroy, to kill, and to liquidate all the Jews. All the Jews had to do was say, I'm not Jewish. Any Jew that would just declare, excuse me, you have no right to uh, to try to kill me. I'm not Jew. I'm not a Jew. The decree is to kill the Jews. I'm not Jewish. So what do you mean? We saw that you have a mezuzah on your door. Look at my door. You'll see. There's no mezuzah. No, I took it. The, you took it down. What, what did you? What do you care? The decree is to kill you right now. I'm not Jewish. That would have been it. No one, no Jew would have been killed. Nobody Jew would have been in danger. It was an easy way to finish the whole thing. That we didn't need the whole holiday of Purim, and that was it. The Jews says the first Rabbi of Chabad. There was not one Jew, man, woman, children, elders. No one, not one Jew, even thought. To say that I'm not Jewish. It didn't arise in the in the mind. Everybody knew that it was an option. Nobody took that option. No one took that option. And that was the miracle of Purim. Insane clinging to God. That's at the tetzaveh. means to connect. In, insane connection to God. Where did they get this connection from? Mordechai. There was a Jew called Mordechai. He was the Moses of the generation. And Mordechai made everybody crazy. That you are Jews, and he connected all the Jews. Mordechai was the Moses of his generation. He did it at the Tetzave. He connected the Jews. <clears throat> he connected the Jews to God. That all of the Jews, the Jews wanted to live. Nobody wanted to die, but they could not give up their Judaism. They did not want to lie to themselves or to the world by saying, "I'm not Jewish," even though it would have worked. No, they couldn't do it. They had to crush. And that crushed them. That crushed them. Mordechai taught them that when there was the decree, they had to crush themselves. But, says the Rebbe, we see a very interesting thing. After there was this crushing, and the Jews, there was the big holiday of Purim, but afterwards the Jews reverted back to, you know, easy life again. The second temple was destroyed. Says the Rebbe, why? Is it because that type of crushing there was that Haman crushed the Jews that put brought out this pure oil of self-sacrifice. That was because the crushing came from the outside. Says Lubavitcher Rebbe that our generation is the generation of Mashiach. And the Mashiach, the Lubavitcher Rebbe is the Mashiach. And the Mashiach is telling you that now you have to crush yourselves. How do you crush yourself? What are we, what are we supposed to do? And we're not in any danger. We're not in any... What's supposed to crush me? So the Rebbe, every Jew is supposed to be crushed from the fact that there is one person in the world that does not know about what God is. One Jew in the world that does not know what Judaism is. One non-Jew in the world that doesn't know what the seven Noahide commandments is. If there's one person in the world that is not aware that God is creating them, that not, is not aware of how good God is, of the truth of the Torah, the goodness, the sweetness. If there's one person in the world, one Jew, that is not aware of his true Jewish identity, this should crush us. This should make us feel crushed. Who's going to crush us? We ourselves. As soon as you get rid of this attitude, say, listen, I'm not going to drive myself crazy. That's it. You won't, you won't be crushed. You'll have an easy life. But says the Rebbe, I'm telling you, that's not a true life. A true life is that you should be crushed by your responsibility to fix up the world. 
and to do it the way that God wants, that crushing is what will bring out this pure oil, that this pure oil is what's going to illuminate the whole entire world. That's what's going to bring and reveal Mashiach now. That same happiness of Purim, which was caused from the outside by Haman pressuring us, that happiness is going to be eternal in the whole world for everybody. No one's going to have to die. There won't be any wars, no, no destruction. No, It says, we say in the Aleinu prayer three times a day, even the evil people will turn to the creator for the simple reason that the creator is creating them. That's the fact. But it takes us to crush ourselves in order to, to realize this. And that's what the Rebbe wants us all to do, that we should crush ourselves with this feeling of responsibility. I have to do something unusual, something positive, something good to make the world a better place. And when we do, God will help us. And for sure, it'll happen. We'll see the third temple. The world will be illuminated with the light of the creator of the universe. And we'll all dance together with Mashiach now. God willing, tomorrow morning, 8.15, Israeli time, will be also a class for three quarters of an hour. And we'll finish the Devar Malchut that we had about the uniqueness of the month of Adar, the Jewish people, and Moses. Have a good day. See you all tomorrow. Shalom. Uvracha.